We know the result of ignorance and greed in human behavior and in human society. We're not yet fully aware of the result of knowledge, consciousness, and generosity. So that's the moment in history where we are. It's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. That's a huge, huge understanding. We can choose consciousness and generosity. And if we do that, we are on the flourishing path. Welcome to the Flourishing Path Podcast. Good to see you too. Good to see this place. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Beautiful. We're so blessed to be here and to be looking at these microbes that we're surrounded by in this gorgeous forest. It's really exciting that you've come and that you've brought your equipment and can show us things that we can't see with the naked eye. So can you tell us what is the importance of studying microbiology for, for healthy soils. Yeah, absolutely. So when we're studying microbiology for healthy soils, basically what we're doing is tapping into an ancient connection between microorganisms, which are life that we can't see with our eyes. We have to use specialized equipment like this microscope. We need to go to at least 40 times or 100 times what the human eye can see to be able to identify these critters. And um, so these, these organisms have been literally building soil, working with plants since before plants existed on the planet. And so at this point in time, um, due to you know, chemical agriculture, overtilling, um, unfortunately just human activity, we have begun to squash out a lot of the micro life that's on this planet. And so, the reason we got into studying this and realized the importance of it was we, we were studying at Dr. Ling's Soil Food Web School. We got our basic information on how to use the microscope, how to sample soils, look at compost. And we started looking around and we didn't see life anywhere we looked. Um, we're looking at you know, at-home gardens, large-scale agriculture, healthy gardens, unhealthy gardens, just basically anywhere we would look where humans had been existing consistently, we were not seeing the life that we expected to see. And so it became apparent to me that, you know, people just are not able to understand what's happening because they cannot see the life in the soil. And it really, it, it, it made me think about the whales. When the whales started to disappear, people couldn't see whales, we weren't out in the ocean. And so how did we go about creating empathy for these whales? We started to video them. We started to show people that they exist and suddenly that, when a human can see something with its eyes, when it can know it, it exists, then suddenly you can understand like, that this life is important and you can begin to empathize and see how you can adjust your life you know, to support these other parts of the world wide web, all the other animals, microbes, and creatures on this planet. And so these organisms are the basis of, of all life in the entire world. All of us are here, we're able to eat because of microorganisms, there isn't a living creature on the planet that digests food without these guys. Well, it's not just the food or the fertility, it's also the atmosphere. Yes. And the, and the hydrological cycle well, as well. it's all of it, isn't it, John? It's, it's everything is connected together in a web. It's not just the soil food web isn't just about microbes. Um, that web expands out from the soil to the plants, to the insects, to the people, the mammals, the atmosphere, the ocean, all of it is connected, right? And you know, I think, I think what's really exciting for me, too, is that we're facing an existential threat, and more than one existential threat, actually. So if you look at the biodiversity loss situation, or you look at the climate change issues, and there are probably more, like the toxicity and, and emissions, you, you, you got a, a bunch of levels that are passing planetary boundaries already. Mm -hmm. And so what we're really seeing is that actually, if we understand this, the early successional aspects of evolution, 
then we can see a way forward how the Earth, through co-evolution and interbeing, really, are able to sequester carbon, are able to breathe and, and to generate and constantly filter and continuously renew an oxygenated atmosphere and a freshwater system and fertility and amazing biodiversity. So it's all here. And the idea that we're going to make a new machine <laughs> and like hoover up the air out of the sky or something and you know like what are you talking about this is the only known technology which has created constantly filtered and continuously renewed not only an atmosphere but the fertility of the soil and the, the hydrological cycle and contributed to the amazing biodiversity around the world so this is where we have to go yeah, yeah if, if you think about right like think about what the world was like when these things first appeared it was like the most toxic like uninhabitable place of, you know just like mars basically with water would be the only difference and so yeah like bacteria um basically mitosis is something that has generated all the soil on the earth like you had mentioned and yeah so these guys have the capability of the genetic dna or the genetics is there to be the thing that helps restore the earth and actually pull that stuff out it's even more bizarre because we have their their dna in our dna too because we come from this. yes <laughs> that's it's not why we didn't invent this, this isn't like a, that's what's interesting about this work is that we we haven't created something new we haven't invented a you know a new thing where there's all this ip that needs to be protected and hidden this is just assisting the ancient systems that have been happening forever. So, you know, some of the pioneers that have, you know, begin with Dr. Elaine Ingham, who begin to understand and classify these organisms and make it simpler for us to understand, just giving us a little insight into what's actually going on in nature. So we're just supporting something that's been happening forever. Yeah, most of the work we do is just changing our current ways into something that's just a little bit more inclusive of the microorganisms. As you mentioned biodiversity loss, like that's only, like we only see that on the macro scale. Mm. We unfathomable amount of microbiology has been decimated from this planet. You know, you think about species loss of just macro versus micro, it's, a, it's, it, it's probably a number that we don't even have, we can't even count, you know, like what we've destroyed on this planet. I used to think about it in a, in a weird way, because like if you were sitting here in this house, of this building and and a wrecking ball <laughs> fell through here and like everything was destroyed and you know can you imagine what a community of microbes living in the pedosphere and you know <laughs> happily moving around and wham they're like and you know that's the same but it's another scale yeah how quickly can you rebuild yeah. That's where we're at now. Again and again. Again and again. <laughs> and that's what's unique about this property that I'm seeing when we look under the microscope is that, yes, there's, a, there's an area here where people have been operating, existing, gardening, and these people have been trying to do it the right way. You know, this isn't, this isn't land that has been stomped on and toxified. This has been caretaken. Well, it was a little bit stomped. Stomped. <laughs> yes, it was. It, it, it was that compacted. Was it, yeah, I got, it is I compacted. Worded that better, yeah. but the people have been trying. But just outside of this area where people are living, there's thriving micro life, mm -hmm. you know. And then, in just on the other side of it, on the other side of the road, we see compaction. We see lack of micro life in the soil. And so, this place is very specially suited because it has the inoculum already to regenerate the soil that's here. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting when we were, you know, we were walking up in this area, which, you know, is where more of the cabins and the people habitat is. And you and I were talking about that and how um, there is like an absence of life in those areas, but there's a lot that we can do to bring life back into it and, and to design the like things like the walkways and paths such that we cultivate life around them and carefully consider where we put them and to avoid things like compaction and getting to see the 
uh, microorganisms under the microscope in these different areas has really blown my mind because it's uh, it's there's just such an abundance of of life in it. Why would you not want that? you know? Why would you not want that? It it yeah. really brings a lot in the perspective with you know with the the things that I've been learning about in our regeneration and restoration adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all these regenerative efforts, permaculture, um, you know. What's it called? I'm, I'm, I'm losing the word. Biodynamic. Biodynamic farming. Um, yeah, I mean, basically any of these methodologies that we're using to heal the planet is it, they're they're wrapped around microbes. We just don't that just hasn't been popularized with it yet, right? Mm -hmm. But what are we doing in permaculture other than accumulating biomass, giving space for microbes to thrive, holding water on the ground? Mm -hmm. And so this is just it's an added step. And like I said before, now that you've seen it, you can understand okay, this is how we go about living with these creatures so we don't hurt them. This microscope is a method of checking up on our work, seeing how we're doing, checking ourselves. Because, you know, often, I mean, I, I know before I got into it, I thought I was doing everything right. Um, and, you know, sometimes I wasn't creating as healthy of soil as I thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how could you? I, I wonder, because I'm definitely, this is the first time I've ever even really known of microorganisms in this sense of how they're so helpful to our day-to-day uh, -to -day life. And so then I think about my day-to-day -day life and consider, you know, like if you're sort of typically like mowing the lawn and like going to work and throwing stuff away and it's going to the landfill and, you know, they're clear-cutting forests to add apartment buildings and, and I just, we just don't think about it at all. No. And then it's, and then I wonder about us too as human beings. It's like it's we're so transactional on the macro level um, that I wonder how much of this is like the cause of problems, but we're so in the macro solutions of it that effects and solutions of it that we don't actually we're not even aware yet of of that impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what been lost or you know, the thing. yeah, yeah, because yeah, most all conservancy is right now is focused on basically the largest things on the earth, right? Like we focus most of it on elephants, rhinos, tigers, lions, you know, like. But there's also so, well, that's a, that's an interesting point. But there's also a problem that there's been ba this sliding baselines forever. Mm. So basically, people want what they understand. So they're, they're really looking at massively dysfunctional systems. That's the first thing that they came in contact with when they became aware that there was life on Earth. And that's after 4.5 billion years of Earth time and 3.8 billion years of evolution. And then human beings have only been around for this last few tens of thousands of years, or maybe a hundred thousand years, or something like this, maybe a bit more. I, you know, who knows? I mean, there, there are pre they keep pushing the number. Back. Well, they're pre-human. <laughs> like Lucy is three point something million, and the Chinese have evidence of people in China a million years ago. So that migration had to come out in that period between three and 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 a million. So, and I, you know, here, I don't know, there's different, in the United States, for, with the Native Americans, they seem to have come from Asia over the land bridge. So there are too many things which look extremely similar, um, like the people themselves, and, and actually the DNA is... The literal face yeah. Yeah, everything. Yeah. So, um, but... And I mean, that's, that's also the way it looks in the Middle East, you know, because like everybody looks like everybody. So, you know, they look like each other and then they hate each other because of something that happened a, a, a very long time ago. But um, it hasn't been that we were conscious of these things. And that seems like it's, you know, I've been, I've been looking at it from this, I don't know, wouldn't, wouldn't really call it a religious perspective, but from the, from the sacred texts of different cultures, you have historical mistakes which were made, 
and then after that, <laughs> some kind of direction takes place. Mm -hmm. And they never got corrected. There was no accountability. And so it just it created feedback loops, which go on for generations until somebody says, hey, let's stop this. Somebody, you know, like, like Gandhi or Nelson Mandela or something like that. Um, they say, well, this is wrong, but let's not do the same thing to make it better. That's not going to make it better. We need to change. So when Nelson Mandela comes out after horrific decades long incarceration, he says, oh, I forgive you. You know, I mean, what could you do <laughs> to the people who, who, you know, and they're going to elect, he's going to be elected the president. And he says, we, we have to put this in, in the past. We have to go forward to the future. That's so beautiful to me. And I think that you, you, should, you should think whether this is the type of like fascination that could shock the incarcerated people that you're working with in, in the, and the guards too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole community of people in that program, if they start to follow this, it's so fascinating that you end up spending the rest of your life going deeper and deeper into this because you can't help it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I was even thinking as you were saying that, like in service to it, where the, when you guys were talking about succession as being such an important part of restoration, that we've, we've taken these environments back to this toxic or barren status that existed you know millions of years ago when these organisms thrived and so they're actually capable of bringing their sort of inherent gifts and talents and abilities <laughs> to those environments that we've sort of regressed to um, I guess highly uh, materials just like objective like non-living states of being yeah i mean i think the big thing is is like um the microbes are going to be here no matter how bad we blow it here it's just whether we're going to be here or not after right. that's really the question life will go on once we destroy the planet to the point where we can no longer live here they're going to be fine <laughs> you know so it really comes down to like if we want to be a part of it or not that's, and, and that's where our consciousness is so important. So if we are aware of these things, we are not hardwired to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. We're hardwired to procreate, to, to live, to survive. So if we can become conscious, that I, I've been thinking for a long time, there needs to be a tsunami of consciousness. It just has to like flood the world and everybody knows. And that, that's, that, that's what we're called to accomplish. When we look at the, the planetary boundaries and we say, well, we're already past some. Well, we gotta go, <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta do something now. So it's a, it's a real call to action. I think this, you know, this is what, what's happening. And I, I notice, like, I have been frustrated for some time, and I know <laughs> Elaine Ingham sometimes expresses a bit of frustration with the, with the scientific uh, and academic world and, and the, the speed with which knowledge can be transmitted. Mm -hmm. And I felt that at different times over the last three decades. But this particular moment in time is a, is a moment where everybody is aware of the mistakes. <laughs> and so they're seeking solutions. So if we can put our frustration behind us and just express the beauty and, and understanding that emerges from learning about such important aspects, which are that have been obscure to most people for such a long time that then, and then make it about empowerment 
and full participation for everyone. Everyone should have the opportunity to understand this and everyone should have the opportunity and we have the need for everybody to participate in restoring ecological function on a planetary scale. So, I mean, our, our need, our purpose is there. It's very well stated and it's clear. And it gets obfuscated with a lot of things that are not important. We need to s let that go. And that's what I'm very excited about is, you know, this is, and it's, it's our generation. I haven't spent the last 40 or 50 years going through the trials and tribulations, being frustrated, being angry, not being heard. Um, we jumped into this, you know, 10 years ago. And I'm just absolutely excited about it because, and, and hopeful, because I don't have all that past time of, you know, just really seeing the icky. I've heard of all that, you know, all these bad things. And, you know, all, I mean, there's, there's lists on lists of, you know, terrible things happening in this world right now, but this is an actionable item that I have seen over and over again work. It, it's not like we're trying to figure out how to make biology work with plants. Like, that's figured out already. So this is, a, this is education and knowledge that can be spread to anyone. It's not difficult. Um, it just takes someone that's going to focus, pay attention, and work with details. And so like, this is a real answer on, on multiple levels. You know, there's this awful saying, the solution to pollution is dilution. And the only reason that works, that you can dilute out pollution and take care of it, is because of these microbes. Right. And so that saying comes from a long time ago, and there was plenty of microbes in the soil to really keep things in balance. But I think we can, you know, just by sharing this, 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 this work with people, especially populations that don't have access to this kind of education. Normally this education level is, you know, you've got to go through many years of university. It's, po it's graduate it's school, yeah. at yeah. least, yeah. But honestly, like, I mean, it's a job that I love. I'm so excited by it. And everyone I know that works in this industry is, you know, captivated all the time by what they're doing and seeing good results. So it's not one of these jobs where you're just banging your head against a wall over and over again. You get more wins than losses. And it's not like it works 100% of the time the moment that you try, you know. Sometimes we have to go at it for a few years to really get these communities established. But on the other hand, sometimes it's just the fact of just putting out these microorganisms where they need to be and they just grow almost immediately. And you're seeing responses within six months, three months, sometimes even sooner. So these are, these are answers that happen quickly, relatively quickly. We've destroyed this over the past, John can quote it better, how many years we've been in existence working on destroying the soil, but <laughs> if we can fix it in three to five years, that's incredible. And if we can do it with people who are you know, educated over just a few months, a few years time, We've got a huge workforce of people that care about this now, that actually want to do something. I think that we also have to look at it not necessarily as a job. Mm. I think we have to look at it as creating value. Mm. The, the problem of the job thing and the way that the economy has been set up for a very long time is just transactional. Yeah. And I think what we need to see is like human rights, the rights that not only humans have, but non-human beings have, are not subject, are they, I mean, it's about ecology and ecology and economy are somehow connected, but it's not that the economy is in charge, especially the way it's measured and, and, and analyzed now. But if we have an economy, which is an economy of truth and of functionality, then it's very different than we have this income-based economy. So if you just want to do something, then break something. If you want to create income, break the window. Then you have to fix the window and you know, you're know you paying people or you, know, you can have an oil spill and make money because 
You do the cleanup. Yeah, all the, yeah. <laughs> but but that's not really true. It's not economic yeah. in, in reality. And a functional economy is about creating value. And when you're willing to create value without saying, well, what's in it for me? You know, <laughs> then like if if you give me something that I'll create value. If you don't, I'm just gonna, you know, do nothing. What? You know, you're alive. So it's a different issue. You're it's you're and we need to go into that other area where we're driven by truth, by what needs to be done, what what our lives require us to do, you know. And then we will be rewarded. Have some faith, you know, that, that we're gonna be. I kind of feel like this should be basic knowledge that every human being should understand yeah. from that sentiment. And that we're sharing our planet with things that we see and, and can't see without a microscope, but those things that we can't see without a microscope are equal. Or they're sharing their planet with us. Or they're sharing their planet with us. I mean, we, we come from the DNA of these organisms um, as it's evolved in uh, succession. And this is actually the first time I think I've really gotten some of those famous documentaries, like yeah. Kiss the Ground or... <laughs> Because, you know, they talk about soil, um, but I still think it's sort of dumbed down to a level of uh, that transactional piece where, like, mm -hmm. this is what you have to do in order to save the planet now. Like, you know, mm -hmm. do a walkathon and, like, support <laughs> soil building in your community. But you don't really get a sense of how personal it, in fact, is and your personal relationship with these organisms, whether they're in your soil or in your body or on your skin. And I, I, I'm like, I don't quite understand it totally yet, but I'm starting to get how I am in that web with these organisms and how if, if they're not thriving, then I'm not thriving. Um, so I find that fascinating. I, um, I love this, one of the, one podcast that was influential in me getting on this path, path was um, a podcast that Joel Salatin did with, uh, with Joe Rogan, and he, he talked about how, he was talking about the biome, and probably living soil too, and you know, in his farm and agriculture, and he's like, I, you know, I actually drink water out of the same trough that my cows do, <laughs> you know, because I want to be drinking the same thing that they are, because, you know, it's, that's what, like, that's what keeps me alive, you know, he's like, I haven't been sick in 30 years, and I'm not going out, like, down to the meadow and drinking out of Cliff's trough, and, you Maybe know, we should. I know, it, you know, and it, it did, it did change the way that I thought about it, and, and you know, Maybe not yet. Not yet. <laughs> and, you know, and that's translated to eating more of the, trying to eat more of the apples off the tree or the carrots from the ground and things like that. And, and like, not like overwash them or like it has no, to be overly sanitized. I don't yeah. them at all. No. And, you know, and so it is recognizing that, like, that this is inside of us and, and that this is us. And so then I start to think about the all of those concepts of of having your food grown locally and having it grown this way and, and how can you how can you create this life in your in your surroundings and so yeah this is this is very eye opening to get to see life blown up on this level because I probably haven't seen it since like eighth grade. <laughs> you know? and can, can we add to that that there's just this phobia we have about like cleanliness Germ. and germs Germ. yes. and how like I this is this is helpful. This is these are I'm existing with them, they're existing with me, we're we're co creating, we're symbiotic. But somehow I've been trained, I can feel it in my body, you know, I've been trained to be uh, for it to be one-sided, that I, I thrive at the expense of microorganisms. And so like I need to overly clean things. I need to like, you know, dirt is dirty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, laundry, you know, just that whole, there's a whole aspect of human behavior that is um, 
it's, frankly, it's warfare against micro communities. There, I mean, there is like reason for that, right? Like bacterial infection probably killed more human beings on this planet than anything has ever killed human beings on this planet. So like, there is like a reason for that, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, like people used to never shower like at all, you yeah. know, and like literally living in our own filth and like, you know, so like, and, yeah, drinking stagnant water and not, you know, there's things that like the reason why we have fear of those things is because it's been something that has been a terror for us in like our whole evolutionary history, right? But now we are to a point where you, we know to wash our hands if you go to the bathroom, you know what I mean? If you're doing something real gross, you know, you can wash your hands. But yeah, not every single thing is always like out to get you. You know what I mean? Right. Like not every surface is covered in stuff that's going to kill you. But it's not just microbes because I mean, we've, we've really been afraid of the, the the big predators. Yeah, nature. And, and so we, we took out a lot That's of That's interesting how it's on both sides. We, we took out a lot oh, of yeah. the top predators. <laughs> we, we've eliminated our threats. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, we took out the top predators and then we became the top of the food chain. And what we need to understand is when you have a species die out, the top of the food chain is the most at risk. Mm -hmm. These guys are going to be okay. Cockroaches are going to be okay. It's humanity that is threatened. So yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right, right? When we came along, we took out the top, and now that we're at the top, what's gonna take out us? Well, we, we, <laughs> we took out the top, but before we took out the top, we were prey. Yeah. So, you know, I think the, the terror comes from the, 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 the DNA mm -hmm. that is left over and comes from generations that ran away from giant predators. Sure, it's like going back to this whole, like this, this, this work does tend to, I mean obviously, just, you just got introduced to it and it becomes a lifestyle, right? So it, 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 it's a work that encompasses everything you do and everything you think about. Like it, it changes your perception of reality as you do it. And how can we as a society thrive if we don't have vital, robust, living soil? And how much of collapse of society in the past or even just the imbalance of the way things are today is due to the fact that we do not have good soil. Because it used to be that you could put a seed in the ground and it grows, and at this point, sometimes even the chemicals won't grow the things anymore. So, I mean, this work, I believe, is, is, is absolutely important to our social structure, to you know, bringing the, uh, you know, the equality back to the people you know, um, it, this is something that you can really, um, it's not just one thing that you're benefiting from. There's so many different aspects of healing soil that comes back around as value or wealth or, you know, like w when I do this work, I get paid all the time. You know, I get paid and my, my digestive health is, mm. is, is fantastic compared to what it used to be. Um, my friends are the coolest people in the <laughs> world. Um, my vacations are getting better. <laughs> I mean, it's Because your vacations are probably working vacations. I'm on vacation yes. right now, baby. Exactly. This is great. Exactly. <laughs> Have I got an idea for you? Oh. Camps. Oh, Ecosystem sure. restoration camps in Brazil, in Mexico, in... Egypt, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Uganda, in South Africa, in India, in the Philippines, mm, yeah, worldwide. I want to say something about that. The Ecosystem Regeneration Camps partnering with this, this, this new reality where, you know, where we're bringing in the focus of the microbes to the Ecosystem Regeneration Camps. So this restoration, is restoration Camps. That's okay. It's a lot regeneration of is all right. But, well, regeneration is more than restoration. There we go. Well, we'll keep the name the same. <laughs> but so when we're when we're regenerating soil in place, um, there's something very special and very sacred about this because so we have the power to use our microscopes to create compost to apply these microbes to the soil to heal them, right? And so these camps, not just the camps, but anyone that's doing this work, mm -hmm. but the camps are a great example all over the world. These serve as protective hub sanctuaries for microorganisms, places where people put extra effort into making sure that the diversity is thriving. 
And now, when a deer walks through the land, when a bird lands on the soil and fluffs its feathers and dust baths, and then it goes to the next place and does that, it's transferring those microbes over to a new place. So these camps that cover the entire world are serving as hubs that are just going to spread wow. out. And that life is going to, our, our partners, the mammals, the birds, the lizards, the amphibians, the fish, they all are going to help us spread this work. And it sounds a little woo-woo, but it's Not absolutely at all. true. I'm getting chills right now just thinking yeah, about really how the smallest thing like matters. These, it's yes. almost like the microorganisms brings me down to that level of sacredness of how just the small, my step. Like, because that's their, you know, I'm stepping on microorganisms. And not to get crazy about it, but the sacredness of just the smallest things and, and how they're contributing to the whole. And this is also a paradigm shift. So this is the, what we need now, because we're, we're in this cycle of violence and revenge that goes back for millennia, and we need to be in a peaceful, just, kind world. And it has to be functional, it has to be sustainable and beyond sustainable, survivable at this point. So this is a paradigm shift which allows us to see everyone has a role to play and it's not culturally specific to one race or culture or religion, it's humanity has to act as a species on a planetary scale and take all the knowledge and continue to follow the, the concept of knowledge because there's way more to know. But we know enough to say this is true. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea that you want to plow all of the land and expose the surface soils to solar radiation has no validity in any scientific way. You cannot say that was a good idea. Every place that did that turned into a desert and has no life and people fled throughout the world to get away from what they'd already done. But they didn't know that they had done it because it took place over such a long period of time. I feel so grateful that you two came here and showed this, shared this information and all these showed us the microorganisms of all these different parts of the land from the forest to the pond to the garden and I feel like I have been introduced to some friends that have always been here but I've never known it <laughs> and I want to get to know them now and I feel a bit remiss. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the, the work that I'm doing is turbo, turbocharged and got a little boost from these little guys that are living in, you know, in everything and, um, and that this living biome is, is now a much more visible part. Like I can see the layers underneath that are actually sustaining life and it's going to influence my relationships with my work and with my friends and all the living things. So go biome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful to know that this community exists. Um, and to see that the microbes are thriving all around it. And I am beyond excited to just keep sharing this knowledge and to keep repping with you guys and, and, and other people in the community and to bring more folks in and show them how this restoration work can be done. Um, thank you so much for having us. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. This place is amazing. Thanks for having us out here. Um, yeah, I'm excited that hopefully we can figure out something in the future to actually come back here more often and maybe hold classes, do some work here on this place. And yeah, I don't know, it's really fun to like throw this stuff up and like watch people's faces when they haven't seen it before. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, really light up, so yeah, it's been fun. Thanks, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Casey, Keisha, for coming on The Flourishing Path. And I'm sure the people who listen to this podcast and watch the podcast will really enjoy this. And I'm pretty sure that the relationship between the land and you is going to carry on and we've we've been working with uh, the Anderson Valley Land Trust and, and many of the neighbors and others 
to work on the Navarro River, which actually you saw the headwaters of today. So there's a great opportunity to work locally and there's a great opportunity to influence the global thinking. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs>